Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this video, we'll get into the renal vascular disorders you are most likely to encounter on the boards. A PDF of this recording is available at the website. So when I mention renal vascular disorders, we're really talking about two sets of derivatives for the boards. There are those that focus on the physiology of renal hypoperfusion and those whose primary focus is on the renal pathology. There is obvious overlap between the two, but this is how the questions will present on Step 1. So these are the key entities, and in this video we will focus on the first, that being malignant hypertension. In terms of nomenclature, the term malignant hypertension is used primarily in discussions of pathology, whereas clinically, these patients will be described as having hypertensive emergencies. So with that definition of a hypertensive emergency, let's get started. So here's the definition. A dramatic elevation of blood pressure with evidence of target organ damage. A typical elevation would be with systolic readings above 200 and diastolics greater than 120, although the level of elevation is less important than the target organ damage. The organs that will be affected include the eyes, described by papilledema or retinal hemorrhage, CNS involvement will be noted, characterized by confusion or headache, and the patient with hypertensive emergency may have evidence of renal involvement characterized by acute kidney injury and or hematuria. From the point of view of the boards, the diagnosis will never be subtle. They'll be going after other derivatives. It is valuable to consider factors that contribute to the pathologic changes. Shear forces can cause endothelial injury with exposure of collagen, which triggers the cascade of primary hemostasis characterized by platelet deposition. The activated platelets release growth factors that result in hyperplasia of smooth muscle pictured in the right graphic. The result is lumen obliteration. The left graphic demonstrates the duplication of basement membrane, resulting in the characteristic onion skin appearance. In terms of other pathologic descriptions, malignant hypertension will be described by fibroid necrosis or necrotizing arteriolitis. That's not too bad, as the term fibronoid is essentially referring to necrotic tissue. Do not confuse the fibroid necrosis of malignant hypertension with that of polyarteritis nodosa. In polyarteritis nodosa, the fibronoid necrosis may be described by necrotizing vasculitis, highlighting the idea again that fibronoid simply describes a necrotic process. In PAN, however, transmural inflammation will be noted. And returning to the characteristic onion skin lesion, this may be described as hyperplastic arteriolitis or arteriolosclerosis. In either case, it refers to the concentric proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells with duplication of basement membrane. As noted, this finding correlates with the presence of renal failure. All right, that is all we have for pathology. Moving on to key clinical associations, you will see the double-headed arrow between cause and consequence. This is entirely important, but you should be aware CNS injury, as previously discussed, can precipitate a hypertensive emergency, but a hypertensive emergency can manifest or cause CNS injury. Likewise with aortic dissection. A dissection into the renal arteries can cause a hypertensive emergency, but hypertensive emergencies can also cause aortic dissection. Causes and consequences. Other noteworthy causes where severe blood pressure elevations may come up is with certain drugs such as MAO inhibitors or drug withdrawal as seen with clonidine. The endocrinopathies can cause hypertensive emergencies and these will be reviewed in a separate presentation. Be aware that both the heart and kidneys can be impacted by a hypertensive emergency, but the next two slides highlight why I'm including this section. I usually try to avoid laundry lists, but you need to be aware of the association between malignant hypertension and diffuse systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis can present with an obliterative arteriopathy and similar pathologic findings, including smooth muscle proliferation, will be described. The last key association is that of HELP syndrome. Whereas HELP syndrome isn't terribly common, it may be seen in 10 to 15 percent of patients with preeclampsia. It is characterized by the combination of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, elevated liver chemistries, and low platelets. The microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is expressed by the presence of schistocytes, and that is the money. Both malignant hypertension and HELP syndrome are additional conditions associated with the presence of schistocytes. As with TTP, think about those activated platelets at sites of endothelial injury interacting with fibrinogen and shearing RBCs that happen to be traveling by. All right, 
We looked at the definition, pathology, and key associations with malignant hypertension. Now we just have to treat it and we are done. Unfortunately, the treatment is nuanced, and this is the setting in which you will see nitroprusside questions and derivatives. So let's explore how they will come after you. For starters, the left side of graphic demonstrates the nitroprusside molecule. Do note it has a nitric oxide side chain. We know that nitric oxide is associated with smooth muscle relaxation, but whereas nitroglycerin is primarily a venodilator, nitroprusside is both a venodilator and a vasodilator. We'll come back to that in a moment, but let's spend a moment reviewing how nitric oxide actually works. It does raise intracellular cyclic GMP levels, but from there it accomplishes two downstream effects. It decreases intracellular calcium and it activates protein kinases that lead to the dephosphorylation of myosin light chain. I have seen them ask both derivatives, so you should be familiar with both mechanisms of action. And speaking of mechanisms of action, I won't beat this to death, but if nitric oxide decreases intracellular calcium, it will be less available for binding to calmodulin, and that complex binds to myosin light chain kinase. No kinase, no contraction. Similarly, in stimulating myosin light chain, phosphatase, smooth muscle relaxation, ensues. This slide should serve as a reminder for mechanisms of contraction relaxation in vascular smooth muscle. So let's move on to the pathophysiology of malignant hypertension and ultimately nitroprusside. I annotated this curve has a similar morphology to the aortic stenosis curve. Although we want to understand the physiology, there is nothing wrong with simply looking at the shape of a curve and identifying what the hell they're talking about. So this is the increased afterload curve. A simple derivative that they like to use is demonstrated. An old chap with syncope and an aortic stenosis murmur has this pressure volume curve. Which of the following conditions will also present with the same curve? Answer, malignant hypertension. That's easy. This curve can also be the gateway to a finite set of afterload derivatives. So what are they? As end diastolic volume can be described by maximal sarcomere length, the increased afterload can be described by decreased velocity of sarcomere shortening. And this makes sense. If a sarcomere has to contract against substantial pressure, it will just take a longer period of time. The other question they are fond of relates to increased myocardial oxygen demand. This also makes sense as afterload is the principal determinant of cardiac work. If you work harder, you need more oxygen. That was easy. So let's shift our focus to nitroprusside and see how it impacts the pressure volume loop. Previously, we mentioned a combined effect on veno and vasodilation. Predictably, therefore, we see a shift to lower end diastolic volume with blood pooling in the large venous capacitance system and a reduction in afterload as a result of arteriolar dilation. And what is the effect of that decreased afterload? in increased stroke volume. Remember that velocity of shortening? A sarcomere with low afterload is a happy sarcomere. And the last nitroprusside derivative relates to toxicity. A patient presents with the pressure volume curve shown. He is treated with a medication, but five days later is confused and develops a seizure. While all the medications shown can be used to treat a hypertensive emergency, only nitroprusside demonstrates this adverse effect. And what is it? Cyanide toxicity. Remember that molecule with the nitric oxide side chain? Well, the rest of it is laden with cyanide side chains. You should be familiar with the symptoms of cyanide toxicity, including psychosis and seizure, as well as lactic acidosis. The lactic acidosis derives from the uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. And a fun little derivative they like to inquire about is the venous AVO2 difference when you uncouple oxidative phosphorylation. If you are consuming less oxygen, the AVO2 difference narrows. That's fun. And finally, be familiar with the treatment of which thiosulfate is most important. And that completes the nitroprusside curriculum. In fact, that completes the malignant hypertension curriculum. Herein, we went over the diagnosis, including key associations, the pathology, as well as the pathophysiology and derivatives related to nitroprusside. The discussion of renal vascular hypertension will continue on the next video. If you have any questions about this or any material, please contact me at 12 Days. Thank you.